Patrick Stewart is known as one of the most eloquent actors of his time. But would you believe that he grew up speaking a dialect so thick he had to relearn the English language in acting class just to be understood? Who Do You Think You Are is a British television series where celebrities sit down with genealogists, researchers, and historians to learn some of the long-buried secrets in their family's past. When Patrick Stewart appeared in the show in 2012, he learned a lot about the father he'd had a shockingly difficult relationship with. After sharing the fact that his older brother Jeffrey was born out of wedlock and that family lore suggested his father had enlisted in the army to get away from his responsibilities, Stewart was presented with records that confirmed his father Alfred Stewart had enlisted two weeks after his brother's birth. Maybe the actor in me is inclined to see that as a dramatic and perhaps desperate gesture. He also learned that his father was a member of the regimental police, which made absolute sense to him. They were powerful, intimidating, and wildly feared. Stewart said, All of that merges with a picture that I, by first-hand experience, am very familiar with. Stewart was born about the same time his father was sent off to overseas service in World War II. For the first five years of his life, he was raised by his loving mother. Then his father, essentially a complete stranger, suddenly showed up, fresh from the battlefield. Stewart shared with Who Do You Think You Are, I think that I was indulged and spoiled and petted and loved during those five years. All of that changed dramatically when this man appeared in the house. Stewart revealed that while he can't remember his father ever hitting him, his mother was often the target of his father's violent outbursts. He never really understood the source of his father's violence, but Who Do You Think You Are allowed him to make some sense of things. A newspaper clipping revealed that his father's war service, which included staying behind in the beaches of Dunkirk and being among the last evacuated, had left him suffering from what was called shell shock at the time and what we now call post-traumatic stress. Stewart has regularly supported charities such as Refuge that help those affected by domestic violence. It's a subject that is deeply personal to him. In a piece for The Guardian, Stewart shared that during the week, his father was a hardworking and charming storyteller, but on the weekends, he would drink. Stewart wrote that they would listen for the sound of singing as his father returned from the pubs. Certain songs were reassuring, but army songs were not a good sign. And worst of all was silence. When I could only hear footsteps, it was the signal to be super alert. What inevitably unfolded was terrifying violence that occasionally ended only when an ambulance or law enforcement was called. Even then, Stewart said that police who responded would often tell the family that clearly his mother had done something to deserve being hit. He wrote, No one came to help. No adult stepped in and took charge. I needed someone else to take over and tell me everything was going to be all right and that it wasn't my fault. I wanted the anger to go away and when it stayed, I felt responsible. Stewart has been open about the violence that he grew up witnessing. In 2023, he told The Guardian that after decades of therapy, he's finally at a place where he has some understanding of how he was shaped by his father's violent behavior. Stewart told Rich Roll that he always had a fear that the potential for violence he saw in his father existed in him too. He explained that he'd initially turned down the role of Leontes in a 1981 production of The Winter's Tale because it required a performance of anger that he hadn't felt able to face, something director Ronald Ayer knew instinctively. Air told him, You're not going to have to interpret him. He's already inside you. I know that. Even in his 80s, Stewart said that he was still seeing a therapist on a weekly basis and was still looking for answers to the violence that defined his childhood. He acknowledged that it wasn't easy, and telling Gentleman's Journal that when he first thought about therapy, he worried that he'd lose whatever it was that gave him his acting ability. But of course, as all actors have found out, it actually opens more doors to new demons. Stewart has been incredibly candid about the abuse that he saw his mother suffer at the hands of his father, and he told The Telegraph that it wasn't just the violence he needed to come to terms with. To know that you were surrounded by people who were aware of the horror stayed with me, and that's why I never talked about it. He said that it continued only until he was old enough and physically imposing enough to put an end to it himself, at least while he was in the house. After spending some of his time at school training as a boxer, he said, I warned him that if he did anything to her, he would come off worse. He took that message on board. For him to have a son stand up to him in that way created complex feelings. He just became too old to be a warrior. When at times I would intervene in rows between my mother and my father, I would put my body between them at what I thought were critical moments. He's used that complexity in his work, tapping into both his father's toughness and his mother's kindness for one of his most famous roles. He wrote in his memoir, From him, I drew Picard's stern, intimidating tendencies, but I like to think that my mother is in the captain too, in his moments of warmth and sensitivity. 
Sometimes processing trauma means using the tools that are available at the moment, and for a long time, Stewart used acting in theater as his way of dealing with what had happened around him as a child. He told The Guardian that it was an escape from the real, awful world at home. He recalled the first time he read for a Shakespeare play, saying, I couldn't even pronounce some of the words, but I escaped, and my dream became more of a dream, not just of having a different life, but for the few minutes I had on stage actually living it. Stewart told the Yorkshire Post that he credits his English teacher, Cecil Dorman, with discovering his talents as a young actor. But even before he came into his own as an actor, he knew that the stage was where he belonged. He wrote in his memoir, Making It So, that a job as assistant stage manager in the Lincoln Repertory Theater changed his life. I was part of all this now. Indeed, I had responsibilities to fulfill, even if they were as a lowly assistant stage manager. This, I thought, is now my home. Surely, the hardest part about acting is, well, acting, right? Not necessarily. Stewart wrote in his memoir that going from the stage to a television set was such an adjustment that it took an intervention from some of his castmates to get everyone on the same page. He wrote, On the TNG set, I grew angry with the conduct of my peers, and that's when I called that meeting in which I lectured the cast for goofing off and responded to Denise Crosby's We've Gotta Have Some Fun Sometimes, Patrick comment by saying, We are not here, Denise, to have fun. And it could have been the end right there as everyone else found it absolutely hilarious. Except, of course, for Stewart, who stormed out. It took Jonathan Frakes and Brent Spiner pulling him aside to get him on board with a television show set mentality, reminding him that they weren't on a London stage. In addition to having a different culture in the day-to-day, -day, they gently told him that he wasn't making any friends by going all King Lear on them. Stewart admitted, I had failed to read the room. And of course, they were right and we yes. had a great time. While many people rock the bald look by choice, Stewart wrote in his memoir that when he was 17 years old, his dark, thick hair started to thin. He soon realized that he had the overwhelming urge to stop by the hair loss clinic he walked by on a regular basis. He raised the money by working as a bricklayer for three weeks, went to the clinic, and found it didn't do any good. Completely bald on top by 19, he went for the comb-over look. A really, a kind of Donald Trump comb <laughs> Finally, some older and wiser friends taught him a very important lesson. While on the BBC talk show Parkinson, he shared that a friend from drama school had invited him over for lunch. A meal and a bottle of wine later, the friend, who was a black belt in judo, pinned Stewart's arms behind his back while his wife cut off the comb over. When it was over, he told Stewart, Now you be yourself. No more hiding. Stewart also shared a touching story about Gene Roddenberry addressing Picard's baldness. When asked to explain why a futuristic starship captain would be bald, when that had surely been cured by then, Stewart said, And Gene Roddenberry said, No, by the 24th century, no one will care. It's one of the nicest things that's ever been said about men like me. All celebrities have recognizable voices to some extent, but Patrick Stewart's voice is just iconic. It turns out, though, that Stewart's stage voice and real voice have next to nothing in common, and according to what he told the Irish Times, that's the result of a lot of work. I didn't just have an accent. I spoke Yorkshire dialect, and if I was going to a friend's house, I'd say, Is thou kimun utilark? That is, are you coming out to play? It's dialect. That's a lake up. That's a lake he explained that while an accent uses different inflections, a dialect is different words altogether. And when he shifts back into his native tongue, most English speakers wouldn't be able to understand a word. Stewart says that from the age of 12, he worked to be able to hide his Yorkshire accent very, very well. He attended acting and pronunciation classes and said, I had to be careful not to mix it up. I'd be hit over the head if I spoke upper class with my friends. And he says the Yorkshire dialect is still natural for him. When he speaks to friends and family back home, it's Yorkshire all day long. My wife says that I almost immediately become incomprehensible. Being in the theater brings a certain amount of superstition with it. Just look at the strict observance of never saying the name of the Scottish play. But belief in the paranormal? According to Patrick Stewart, absolutely. In a Sky Arts documentary series, Stewart and longtime BFF Ian McKellen were talking about an incident that happened during a performance of their Waiting for Godot. They recalled a show where McKellen needed to ask the always professional Stewart what had happened to throw him off his game. And he explained, I just saw a ghost on stage during Act 1. It wasn't just any ghost either, as they believe Stewart saw the apparition of John Baldwin Buckstone. In addition to being a good friend of Charles Dickens, Buckstone was also the theater manager and the person who came up with the idea of matinees. Stewart has had ghostly experiences off the stage, too. In his memoir, he recalls buying an already inhabited home in Los Angeles. He wrote, Yes, it was haunted. There was no question about that. There were phenomena present in that house that could not be explained, and that I experienced and were experienced by others. 
He went on to describe hearing footsteps and voices in empty rooms, strange changes in temperature, and even books flying off their shelves. He wrote that eventually, living in a haunted house became bothersome. Stewart was 72 years old when he tweeted a photo that went viral for the simple fact that it seemed so very unlikely. He was eating a slice of pizza and looking a little under the weather and worse for wear in the photo, which he captioned, my first ever pizza slice. That's about where the world went, wait, what? Media outlets were shocked that he apparently had never had pizza before, and the New York Intelligencer got in touch with him to set the record straight. He thought it was hilarious and clarified, people misunderstood. There was a school of thought that I had eaten my first pizza, but of course, how could that possibly be true? I would have had to have stayed locked up in the cellar. But nevertheless, this was my first slice of pizza, which I was only eating because my fiance and I were a little hungover yesterday morning. What do you, you how have you been eating? You order a pizza! You get it, it's this size or it's this size, and you eat most of it. Stewart did, however, admit that he had initially tried the knife and fork method before learning very quickly that it was absolutely wrong. He also admitted that when he was growing up, he hadn't been exposed to pizza much. It was such a delicacy, in fact, that he hadn't entirely understood the words of Dean Martin's That's Amore and had grown up thinking he was singing about a piece of pie. He said, I was actually in my 20s before I saw pizza. It's a sad fact of life that no one gets through it without some regrets. And that applies to Patrick Stewart, too. In 2023, he told CBS that his biggest regrets were his failed marriages. His first marriage ended following his affair with Star Trek co-star Jennifer Hetrick. He later married Wendy Noyce. But his second marriage also ended when he had an affair with a much younger actor, in that case, Lisa Dillon. Stewart was 64 at the time. Dylan was 25. He told The Guardian that the end of his first marriage did some serious damage to his relationship with his children. He said that they had trouble dealing with this affair. And though he was still working to repair the damage, he called it a work in progress. It's very sad. I love my children. But our relationships, they haven't worked out. And as far as his professional career, there are regrets there too. He told The Hollywood Reporter that while he was grateful for the emotional depth he was allowed to find in Star Trek Picard, he wished there was a chance to explore even further further. My only regret is that once Jean-Luc revealed those hidden facts about his childhood to us, I almost wish we could immediately put him back on the bridge of the Enterprise to hear and see what the impact this revelation had on him. But we couldn't do that. Stewart has been acting for decades and became an international star thanks to his roles as Captain Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek and as Professor Xavier in the X-Men films. So you may be surprised to learn that, when asked by the New York Times which role had the biggest impact on him, he didn't cite either of those. Instead, it was a year-long stretch playing Macbeth. The role got into me so deeply it dominated my life at the time and caused me to drink too much alcohol after the performance was over. No other role I have played has affected me so profoundly. He went into more detail with The Guardian, saying that the 2007-2008 run was so exhausting that performing that play took everything he had in him. He said that not only was he drinking too much, but that he would pass out, wake up completely hungover, and have to psych himself up for the fact that he was going to be needed back on stage that night. It was an eye-opening experience, he added, saying that it was the moment that he realized everything has to count. It's not just fun anymore. In 2023, Stewart had a conversation with Wired that touched on sexuality. He explained that being in the theater, he had always been around members of the LGBTQ plus community, saying, I adored these people. And when we arrived in Sydney, I moved into a house with three gay men. And their kindness, generosity, humor, and commitment to their work so impressed me that I fell in love with them. I fell in love with the man who married Sonny and me, Ian McKellen. When the interviewer revealed that he always thought Stewart was gay, Stewart responded, I take in your assessment of my sexuality with gratitude and a certain amount of pride. He's also spoken to the advocate on the topic, saying that supporting the community was a given. It was always a natural and uncomplicated choice. It was after his friendship with McKellen solidified that he said he was happy to join parades and show support, which makes it strange that he was caught up in some major backlash about one particular stance. In 2015, he appeared on BBC Newsnight to address the issue of a bakery in Northern Ireland that had refused to make a wedding cake for a gay couple, citing their beliefs. Stewart was on the side of the bakery. Why? Because they found the requested inscription offensive, and despite his own personal support of the LGBTQ plus community, Stewart said that everyone had the right to their beliefs beliefs. And I would support their rights to say, no, this is personally offensive to my beliefs. I will not do it. 
In an interview with BuzzFeed, Stewart shared that there were two things going on behind his decision to take the part of the white supremacist gang leader in Green Room, and it started with one of his deepest fears. I think most of my life, what I used to be afraid of was being in a situation where there would be other individuals who I would identify as dangerous with whom I couldn't reason. In the movie, Stewart is, of course, the individual who can't be reasoned with, and Stewart recalled an encounter he had as a 20-something in England. He'd become friendly with a local writer with a troubled past, someone he described as having a tendency to violence. He had, in fact, done jail time for grievous bodily harm, and Stewart saw that tendency up close and personal. They were out drinking one night when the man cornered him in the bathroom and pulled a knife. I didn't recognize him. His face was changed. I felt certain that something really bad was going to happen, and that he meant me harm. Stewart was able to talk him out of using the knife and said that while he didn't cut ties with the man, he was very, very careful around him. In 2019, Stewart appeared on This Morning to talk about a cause that had become heartbreakingly close to him, legalizing assisted dying, which is essentially the right of a person with a terminal illness to choose to end their own life. Stewart became involved in the movement to legalize the procedure after a close friend went through a terrible ordeal. He told the story of an unnamed friend whose wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer and living in constant, unbearable pain. After attempting an overdose with pills, she was hospitalized and returned home. Stewart shared that she had asked her husband to go take their dog for a walk, and when he returned, he discovered that she had asked him to leave so that she might die by suicide. He said it was a traumatic, painful, miserable way to die and a traumatic way for your husband to discover that is how you died. Since then, Stewart has become a supporter of the UK organization Dignity in Dying, saying that it should be a basic human right to choose to die when faced with a terminal diagnosis. He summed his views up in a video for Dignity in Dying, saying, Dying people should not be forced to take drastic measures, traveling to another country to take their own life. They should have the choice to die at home on their own terms. Everyone loves Patrick Stewart, right? Right. So is there anyone that he doesn't get along with? Well, kind of. Stewart dished some very mild dirt in his memoir, revealing that he wasn't a fan of the Star Trek The Next Generation character, Wesley Crusher, played by Will Wheaton, because he felt the character was, quote, a little gimmicky. He wrote that he only realized much later that some of the trouble he had getting along with Wheaton was because he was jealous of his young co-star. In those first weeks, I wished I had Will's confidence. Then shut up, Wesley. Stewart also revealed that he wasn't really a fan of the movie Star Trek Nemesis, and that he didn't really get along with co-star Tom Hardy, as he found Hardy to be aloof. Tom wouldn't engage with any of us on a social level, never said good morning, never said good night, and spent the hours he wasn't needed on set in his trailer with his girlfriend. Stewart says that he was happy to see his prediction that Hardy would never be cast in anything again was wrong, but according to what he told The Guardian, it seemed as though his bitterness toward Gregory Peck is a little more long-lasting. He said that his biggest disappointment is the fact that when Peck won the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor for his role in the 1998 miniseries Moby Dick, he didn't acknowledge Stewart, who played Captain Ahab. Stewart still felt the snub years later. In 2017, Scottish artist Frank Tu spoke with the BBC about an experience that had to be a little out of body. The year before, Stewart had reached out to him and asked him to be his one-on-one -on -one art teacher. It wasn't completely out of the blue. Tu was an alumnus of Huddersfield, where Stewart was a vice chancellor, and Stewart had attended his degree show in Glasgow. About a year went by before Stewart approached him about art lessons, and he explained, When we first met, Patrick had just had a heart operation, and I had gone from degree to master's to unemployment. It was a strange and confusing time for us both, but we discovered we had so much in common. Tu said he thinks Stewart may have used some of his lessons in his film career, saying, I think he may have had a say in the new Logan movie, because I recognize the color schemes and scenes, and even in what he's wearing. Stewart has always been fascinated by art, and in an interview with the Radio Times, he shared the utterly charming fact that his love has led him to another particular hobby, jigsaw puzzles. He said that no matter where he is, he's usually in the middle of working on one, and often it's a photo of a fine art piece. What's the attraction? It truly makes you look at the painting and its detail. It teaches you a lot. After his memoir finally hit shelves in 2023, Stewart was very open in a number of interviews about how cathartic writing the book had ultimately been. He said that on the one hand, it had been surprisingly easy to go back through the years, and surprisingly therapeutic, with the process leading to some of the happiest days of his life. But on the other hand, he said there were plenty of tears as well. And that's not entirely surprising, especially considering that a large part of his memoir dealt with a childhood trauma that he's still trying to come to terms with. But he's also shared how he's tried to make sure that he 
learn something from every one of life's experiences, even the painful ones, such as the painful process of getting shots to treat his arthritis. He told Gentleman's Journal, There's this thing called sense memory. I kept saying to myself, Remember what pain like this feels like. What does it do to you? What's happened to your breathing? What's happened to your skin? No experience is a waste of time. If you or someone you know is dealing with domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also find more information, resources, and support at their website.